Okay. Should we get started? Sounds great. Hey, hi, this is Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today, and welcome to our first live interview via Google Plus Hangout on Air. Uh, hopefully you've been able to watch the other live hangouts that we've been doing. Um, we have the weekly space hangout that we do where we have a group of space journalists discuss the week's breaking news, and that's every Thursday morning. And then Fraser has been doing some virtual star parties where he's been able to show uh, live views through telescopes from around the world from amateur astronomers, and uh, that's been really exciting. But this is our first live interview, and we're really excited about it, and hopefully it will be something that we can do regularly. So um, joining me here today is Fraser Kane, who's kind of manning the control booth today. So thanks, Fraser. And then the, the person who is going to go down in history as our first <laughs> li live interviewee is uh, Scott Maxwell from the Mars Exploration Program at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Hey, everybody. Hey, hey. Howdy. Well, thanks so much, Scott, for being our first uh, victim, guinea pig. Uh, oh, thank you. It's, I'm, <laughs> I'm very excited to be here. It's awesome. Yeah, I, I should say that you were a very willing participant. As soon as I suggested this to Scott, he was very excited about it. So thank you so much for that. Absolutely. Yeah. So um, as Fraser mentioned yesterday during our weekly space hangout, as journalists, we get to do interviews all the time. You know, we talk with scientists and engineers, uh, astronauts, and people from the space agencies. And, um, you know, but in a 500 to 1,000 word article, we basically can use a couple of quotes and, and ideas right. of things that we've talked about, but, but there's this great conversation that you've just had, a lot of it can go unused. So uh, we're thinking that this is a great way to share the experience that we journalists get to have with a lot more people. So That's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it'll take off and we can do a lot more of these. So um, a few housekeeping things for people that are watching. Um, if you've not done a Hangout on air before, this is, is not a Hangout that you can join in the video portion. You can just watch. But that does mean that unlimited people can watch and not just the eight or so people that can normally be in a Hangout. Um, uh, but you can join in our discussion by posting things in the comments on, on Fraser's Google Plus feed. Also, we're also on the CosmoQuest Hangout page. So if you go to Cosmos, CosmoQuest Hangouts, uh, like we have been doing in the past for, this, for the Space Hangouts. So it's also there. And we're hoping that it's showing on Universe today. Uh, we're hoping to put a, a live feed there. Hopefully it's working. Um, and uh, anyway, so well, let's get started with our interview. Um, uh, Scott, you are known far and wide as the <laughs> Mars ro rover driver. So tell us, you know, how do you drive a rover sitting on Mars millions of kilometers away? Well, I'll tell you how we'd like to drive them. We wish that we had a joystick. Um, so you would just like uh, push forward on the joystick and the rover would go and you would like or the joystick and the rubber would stop. Uh, that would make my job a lot easier if we had one of those. Um, but of course, we don't have one. And the reason that we don't have one is that uh, light is too slow. Um, so basically, um, uh, you know, the, the, if we send a signal to the rover, the fastest it can get to the rover is the cosmic speed limit, the speed of light. And if the rover wants to send data back to you, um, it comes back at the same speed. So, uh, so, so now the problem is, um, that uh, Earth and Mars are so far apart that even when they're as close as they get to each other on the same side of the sun, that one-way light time delay is four minutes. So if we had a joystick and we push forward on the joystick um, and the signal left our joystick immediately and started propagating to the rover at the speed of light, um, it would take four minutes for the signal to get to the rover to tell the rover to move. So the rover's not going to know until four minutes later that we told it to move. Then the rover starts moving, and the problem is that even if the rover sends us back data right away telling us that it started moving, that data doesn't get back to Earth for another four minutes. So just imagine that you're in your car, you're trying to back your car out of your driveway, right? So you turn around, you look out the back window, and you hit the gas, and nothing happens for four minutes. Then your car starts to move, but when it starts to move, you don't know about it because the back windshield doesn't start updating for another four minutes after that, right? You're going to have a hell of a time getting to the grocery store, even if there's no other traffic on the road. So, um, and, and remember that that's the best case scenario. That's when Earth and Mars are on the same side of the sun. The worst case scenario is Earth and Mars are on opposite sides of the sun, as far apart as they get from each other. And then that one-way light time delay goes up from four minutes to 20 minutes. Um, so as you can imagine, we don't uh, drive the rovers that way. Instead, we take advantage of the fact that the rovers are solar 
powered, and they got to shut down for the Martian night anyway. So when it gets to be late afternoon in the rover time, the rover stop whatever they're doing, send us back uh, pictures and other data telling us about the world around them, and then the rovers go to sleep for the night. And that's when I and my team go to work. So uh, we basically are spending the entire Martian night planning out the next day for the rovers. Um, and, um, uh, and so we kind of like, we take all the data and pictures that the rover sent us back. Uh, we put those into a 3D world that runs inside our Linux desktops. And now we do have a, a joystick that we can use to control a software copy of the rovers that we put down inside of that world. So it's very much like playing a video game all day. Um, so once we get the software copy of the rover doing what we want the real rover to do, we take all the commands that made it do that. Uh, and we send it out to the real rover, and uh, the rover starts carrying out its commands for the day. We go home and we go to sleep. Um, so the, the ways in which this gets complicated are, um, first of all, that, uh, that, that I sort of talked about this globally as we're working through the Martian night. But of course, as with most things in interplanetary exploration, it's not that simple. Um, the big problem here is that the Earth and Mars day links are not the same. The Martian day length is about 40 minutes longer than the Earth day. So if you really want to work on Mars time, if you really want to do this as efficiently as possible and actually plan during the Martian night and actually have the rover active for every Martian day, then you have to worry about not when the sun is up in the Earth sky, but when the sun is up in the Martian sky. And that means you work on Mars time. So you work according to that 40 minutes longer clock every day. So if you come in at... Um, so, you know, you, you come in and start work at 8 o'clock one morning, then the next morning you've got to come in 40 minutes later, so you've got to come in at 8.40. And the morning after that, you've got to come in 40 minutes later, so you've got to come in at 9.20, and then you've got to come in at 10 o'clock, and then you come in at 10.40, and it kind of marches around the Earth clock this way. And pretty soon you're coming in to uh, work at, you know, 2 o'clock in the morning in wacky times like that. And uh, that's what working on Mars time is really like. Um, now, for the first 90 days or so of the mission, we actually did that. We actually lived on Mars time, and it was wonderful. It was fabulous, and I loved it. I could not get enough of Mars time. Um, but uh, people who have, you know, kids and things like that, like they have a real life here on Earth that they want to <laughs> play with, uh, that's everybody but me, um, they all hated that because it had them working at these kind of odd times of day, and there, there's, you know, kind of... Uh, you, you don't want your body clock getting reset, so you've got to be careful about avoiding your exposure to light and, and all this kind of stuff. So they didn't really like that. And so we've gone instead to a modified uh, Earth time schedule. So basically, we've compressed the planning days. Instead of working you know, an entire 16-hour long or so Martian night, uh, we only work like 8 to 10 hours. And during the phases of this little cycle where that 8 to 10 hours fits comfortably within a Martian night, um, then... Uh, um, uh, then you're, you're fine. You're, you're planning during the Martian night, but it's only part of Martian night, and that's okay. But when you're in phases of this where um, the, uh, the, the, the Martian, the downlink is coming back from the rovers, too late for you to plan an entire Martian day. So let's say the downlink is coming back from the rovers at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, so it's too late for you to plan, you know, according to a normal Earth day. During those times, we switched to a mode where we're planning two days for the rover every other day. Um, so there, there's some restrictions on what you can do, but it's you know it's it's it it, it uh, that's that's kind of the way that we do that, and that's that way people can work kind of normal Earth time schedule, and it works out to about like two day two weeks of uh, planning every day for the rovers, and two weeks of planning every other day, and then back to two weeks of planning every day. That's one of the complexities. The other complexity is um, I talked about using a software simulator to like kind of simulate what the rovers are going to do, and then you take all the commands that made it do that, and you send it up to the real rover, and that's great when the software simulator is exactly like Mars. Um, the problem is that the software simulator usually is not exactly like Mars. And so let's say you're driving on a really slopey surface and you're trying to drive across that slope. And you send commands to the rover that say drive straight across the slope for five meters. And in the software simulator, the rover drives straight across, across that slope for five meters. But in the real world, the rover's on a slope. So it's going to like drive partly across that slope and partly down that slope. It's going to fall down due to gravity. Um, and so knowing about... Um, about those differences, about where the software simulator is going to differ from the real world uh, is part of the art of the job, and it's, you know, one of many things that makes my job really fun to do. Yeah, so you're saying that people who play a lot of video games would be perfect for the job. 
Um, actually, a lot of people who helped write the rover driving software, I'm looking around the room because this is the room in which we developed that rover driving software, um, are, are either heavy video game players uh, themselves or come from a background of, of developing video games in some cases. Um, and so, yeah, and that's, that's an important, uh, it's an important skill set. I want to point out that just in case there's any kids watching this and they get the idea that, oh, if I play video games all day, I can grow up to drive a Mars rover, it's a little more complicated than that. We actually had to put like, a, lot of, a lot of work and effort into it. So, um, so playing video games is one of the important skills, but uh, uh, very far from being the only important skill on the job. Okay. Well, uh, right now you've got one operational rover on Mars. And uh, man, before we talk about opportunity, I, I wanted to ask you about a picture that was released this week um, from yeah. the high-rise camera showing Spirit still on the, uh, on the surface of Mars. So what was that like seeing your old buddy still sitting there? You know, I, 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 I had two reactions to that. Um, one of them was um, uh, my first reaction to it is... Um, there's a, there's a line in a police song from many years ago called Too Many Cameras and Not Enough Food. And it's, it's kind of making reference to this fact that you can, you can see a lot of problems that you can't do anything about. And my first reaction to it was very much along those lines. that Like, I can see her. Why can't I just fix her, for goodness sakes? <laughs> Why can't I go there and make it all better and fix her and put her back on the road? Um, so, so it was kind of this, like, initially kind of depressing reaction. Um, but when I thought about it more, I had what I hope is a much better reaction to that, which is, um, you know, one of the missions of these rovers, um, they're, they're mechanical systems, and there's nobody there to fix them when they break, and eventually they're going to run down and die, and their last mission is to become a kind of monument to human ingenuity and achievement, of, uh, to remind us of what we can do when we decide that we're, you know, we're going to set out to do great things, and... Um, and Spirit is doing that last job now. She's a monument on another planet, and we're getting these pictures of her from orbit, uh, from our spacecraft that's orbiting that other planet, to remind us that she's there proudly doing that job now of, uh, of, of being kind of a testament to our achievement and, and, and as I say, to what we can do. So, so as usual, I kind of came around to feeling a, a, a great deal of pride in my little rover. Well, that's good. I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah. So um, the news coming from JPL is that um, Opportunity is hunkering down for another long Mars winter. Could That's you right. tell us uh, where she is exactly, and you know how she's sitting, and uh, and just what's coming up next for Oppy? Yeah. Okay. So we spent um, the last three years or so um, going from uh, a crater called Victoria Crater to this much bigger crater. So Victoria seemed huge when we were there. It seemed ginormous. It's half a mile across. That's big, right? Um, but we got done there, and we kind of set out for our next destination. Our next destination was this much bigger crater. It's gigantic. It's like 22 kilometers across. It's 13 miles or something like that. It's bigger than Manhattan. And... Um, uh, this crater is called Endeavor uh, Crater, um, and Endeavor Crater, so it's this ginormous crater, and it's kind of ringed around the sides with a bunch of little hills that are kind of, you know, the, the, hill will kind of, the hills will kind of come and go as you go around this crater. And one of those hills is called, excuse me, it's called Cape York, and right now Opportunity is perched on the, the northern edge of Cape York, um, because uh, she's in the southern hemisphere, and so for her, in the winter, uh, the sun goes to the north, and we want to get her parked on the northern side of that so that her solar panels will be tilted toward the sun. Um, and uh, we needed about 15 degrees of northerly tilt, uh, we believe, to survive the winter in the worst case, and we've got about 15 degrees of northerly tilt, so we're just kind of there and waiting for, um, for opportunity uh, to sort of survive this period where the sun is off to the north and, and the sun to come back to a friendlier spot so that we can then kind of take her off this little hillside and uh, drive around. Okay. Uh, so it sounds like she's not going to be doing a lot of driving um, nope. so that she can stay in a, in a good position. Um, yep. so, uh, so what does a, a rover driver do, do when there's not much driving? Um, well, uh, so the, the rover driver job involves two things. Um, first of all, it, in drives not, it involves not just driving the rovers around, but also uh, uh, using the robotic arms. So the rovers have a robotic arm attached to them. And the robotic arm has scientific instruments on the end of it. And so there's some of that work to do during this winter, not much, but a little bit. Um, so some of it is just uh, is, is, is waving the robotic arm around. Um, the other part of it is um, uh, I am personally uh, was one of the members of the development team for um, 
uh, for creating our rover driving software that we use to drive uh, Spirit and Opportunity around. And uh, I'm working furiously uh, along with my colleagues on getting that uh, software ported so that we can use it to drive MSL around when MSL reaches Mars as well. So. Um, so this little break has uh, turned into a great deal of extra development time for me, and uh, I don't mind it. Okay, all right. Uh, could you talk about some of the science that Oppie will be trying to do while she's kind of just sitting there? Yeah, so Opportunity, even though she's sitting still for the winter, is, uh, is keeping very busy. Um, so she's up to four, uh, has, has kind of four major things going on. Um, the first of those is she's taking what we call um, the Greeley pan. So we're at um, uh, Greeley, what we call Greeley Haven. Um, it's named after uh, one of the science team members, uh, Ron Greeley, who was a, a friend and mentor to a lot of the science team members, um, sadly died last year, and, and was on the MER science team, sadly died last year. Um, after a, a great career, you know, doing planetary exploration and teaching planetary science at uh, um, at Arizona State University, um, so uh, so so uh, we've we've named the you know the the opportunities of Winter Haven this year Greeley Haven and uh, this and we're taking this great uh, uh, 360 degree panorama that we are just about very very nearly finished with and we've downlinked something like 93 percent of it, um, just a little more to go, um, so that's part of it. It's just kind of just kind of looking around where we are, taking a great panorama. Uh, we, we typically do that when we're kind of sitting still in one place for a long time. You might as well take some, some great vacation pictures while you're there. Um, uh, so that's one thing. And um, uh, second thing is um, uh, doing the, uh, uh, a long MOS power integration. Um, so one of, the, um, one of the tools at the end of Opportunity's arm uh, is a spectrometer, a MOS power spectrometer. And um, the MOS power spectrometer uh, uh, it, it functions due to this like little radiation source that's got inside of it, and the radiation source has a 260-day uh, half-life. Now, a 260-day half-life sounds like a really long time when you're planning for a 90-day mission, which this was supposed to be. Um, but as it turns out, we've been on, on Mars for over 2,800 sols now, so we've gone through more than 10 of our half-lives, and 10 half-lives means uh, the radiation source is about a thousand times weaker than when we got to Mars. So if you want to do the same quality measurement as when we got to Mars, if you want to do, you know, one hour measurement then is a thousand hour measurement now. Um, so, uh, so, so part of what we're doing is just sitting still for very long periods of time with the MOS power in the same spot, taking more and more and more and more data. Um, so that we can get a, you know, what will, what, what will possibly be our, our very last reading out of that instrument. Um, at some point, you get to where the, you know, the, the, ha the, the, the radiation source is falling off fast enough that it sort, of, it sort of accelerates away from you into the future, and you can never, you know, get a really good reading out of the instrument again. So I don't know exactly when we cross that line, but we're, we're taking this opportunity to get at least one more reading out of the instrument. That's number two. Okay. Number three, um, one of the things, one of the coolest things I think we've ever done with this rover is absolutely fascinating to me, and it's just spectacular to me that we could even do this, um, is a radio science experiment. Um, so, uh, so we're sitting here on Earth. We've got a rover who's sitting still on Mars for long periods of time, and um, we do radio science communication with that, sorry, radio communication with that rover, and we measure very carefully the Doppler shift in the, uh, the radio signals that come back from the rover. Here's why we do that. Think of a top, right? Take a top, spin the top, and a little while later, the top kind of starts to like wobble kind of back and forth like this, right? And if you look very carefully at it, you'll see that the top isn't just wobbling back and forth like this, but while it's wobbling, it's kind of going around and around, okay? It's got this little secondary wobble that's involved in it. That mm -hmm. big wobble back and forth when planets do it, we call it precession. And that little wobble, we call it nutation. Um, so, uh, so the Doppler shifts that we're measuring with opportunity let us measure the nutation of Mars, that secondary little wobble of Mars is going around its, uh, its little orbit. And the reason why we want to measure the nutation of Mars is so that we can tell is because uh, Mars will nutate in a different way depending on whether it has a solid or liquid core. Okay, so by measuring the little nutation, this little wobble, very sensitively measuring this little wobble and taking very sensitive measurements, very careful measurements to go on over a period of months, we'll be able to tell from Earth, talking to a surface asset on the surface of Mars, whether Mars inside has a liquid or a solid core. Absolutely fascinating stuff. I can't believe we're doing that. 
Yeah. Um, also, we're taking uh, the we'll we'll also be able to get measurements a little better measurements of the um, the precession, so the big wobble as well. Um, we're we're comparing the precession measurements that we get with opportunity to precession measurements that we took with Viking 40 years ago. So we're getting those those measurements separated by 40 years. Um, just like just just an amazing thing. It's worth sitting still for a few months just to do that, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and the fourth thing that we're doing, the kind of lowest priority thing that we're doing, but it's still kind of cool is taking a mosaic of microscopic images. Um, so Opportunity's uh, shoulder joint uh, her ar on her arm is uh, broken, and her arm no longer moves left and right. But it still moves out and in just fine. And what we're going to do is we're going to take, uh, we're going to use Opportunity's microscope to take a long strip of images um, that's kind of looking along um, the, the plane that she can reach. And we're going to look a little bit left and a little bit right of that, and we'll have kind of a 2 by uh, n mosaic, 2 by 16, I think, mosaic of microscopic images, um, the, the longest of these that we've ever taken, is just going to give us a, a good little detailed picture of the, uh, of the uh, in, in, you know, a, a good detailed microscopic picture of this uh, area that uh, Opportunity is parked in front of. So, um, so, so yeah, now we're sitting still, but that doesn't mean we're doing nothing. We're actually up to a whole lot for the winter, and uh, we're going to be up to even more when the winter is over, of course. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, that sounds like a, a busy winter. Yeah, and, uh, definitely. <laughs> keep it active, keep it active. Yeah. So um, how is Opportunity doing as far as all of her uh, mechanical, I mean, you talked about the arm a little bit, but how about Oppie herself? Uh, I know I've seen uh, one of the recent pictures that she had a fair amount of dust on her solar panels. Yeah, well, she, she hasn't gotten worse lately, and basically the status report of the rover is um, uh, a long time ago, six, six and something, six and change years ago, almost seven years ago, uh, her, her right front wheel, um, which can normally kind of steer all the way in, steer all the way out, <coughs> excuse me, that steer actuator failed. Um, so, so that right front wheel is still stuck where it was. Um, I mentioned that her, the, sh the shoulder joint on her arm no, no longer moves left and right. Um, one of her scientific instruments, uh, the miniature thermal emission spectrometer, or mini test as we call it, um, that no longer seems to seems to no longer function. Um, uh, so that that seems to be dead. And as you point out, um, this year her solar panels are dustier than than they have ever been before. Um, normally, for opportunity, we we can pretty reliably get little cleaning events that will come along and blow the dust uh, off the solar panels. Um, this last Martian year, we spent uh, um, over a Martian year kind of charging across the plains, and out there on the plains, um, there really weren't a whole lot of wind events. And so we didn't really get a whole lot of dust cleared off the solar panels. And so it's as a result of that that, that Opportunity solar panels are dustier than ever before. And um, Opportunity has never before had to spend a winter just sitting still. Um, that's something that Spirit had to do every year because Spirit was farther from the equator, um, and so the so the so the winters were a little less friendly to her. Um, but Opportunity's never had to do that before. So so from that point of view, this is the most dire winter that she's ever faced. But um, Opportunity's worst winter looks a lot like Spirit's best winter, uh, frankly. And um, and now that we're on the uh, rim of crater. Uh, we're hoping that uh, that a solar that a, the uh, you know when the winds uh, sorry when the, the 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 weather gets a little warmer um, the winds pick up on Mars that we've got a better chance of getting a clean event this year. Uh, we're also incidentally um, looking into um, uh, from orbital images we're looking into where the orbital images tell us the wind goes um, so that we can potentially find a spot to hang out and actually maximize opportunities chances of getting a cleaning event so if we can find a place where the winds are always blowing anyway um, park opportunity there for a little while and see if the winds come along and clean her off for us you might as well oh wow that's really awesome, <laughs> that is awesome. yeah um, and uh, um, <coughs> I know. I thought I had one other question for you about uh, how Oppie's doing. Um, oh well, any um, any chance that um, you know that her battery would get low enough that she might have to shut down for a while, kind of like what Spirit had to do? No, 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 no. Uh, we should be a good long way away from that. We're keeping uh, Opportunity's battery reasonably full, um, and uh, uh, and. And we believe we have we are sitting in a spot where we will have good enough solar energy to to ride out the winter just fine. So we'll be okay. Um, this is um, we have we have definitely faced challenges like the challenge that you're talking about. We've definitely faced times where um, 
uh, where you know we've we've had dust storms come along. We had a huge one in 2007. A global planet wide planet encircling dust storm was a very dangerous time, and um, you know 98 percent of the direct sunlight was being cut out, and it was a really bad time. And we really had to kind of dig into the batteries and very carefully manage the rover operations to kind of just barely escape through that time on both rovers. Um, this is almost certainly not going to be anywhere near as bad as that. So, so I think we're going to be, you know, it's 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 a situation where we have to take it very seriously, and we have to, you know, be very careful about our resources and our use of our resources. Um, but this is not a, you know, opportunity is not in that kind of danger right now. Okay, that's great to hear. Great to hear. Um, now the Mars rovers have been on Mars uh, over eight years now and been yeah. a, part, a part of your life for a very long time. Could you share your favorite, uh, perhaps a highlight from each rover, uh, kind of a highlight for you? Well, the, the great thing about, the great thing about this, as you say, is that the rovers have been there for eight years, and so I I have lots more than one highlight per rover. <laughs> um, uh, so so that make, kind of makes answering your question easy, um, but. Uh, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you one from each rover, uh, bearing in mind that I could probably give you ten for every one that I give you. Um, for Spirit, uh, literally and figuratively, the high point of her mission has to be reaching the top of Husband Hill. Um, uh, so we land in a uh, you know with 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 Spirit we land in a spot where um, we'd, we'd gone 300 million miles to the surface of another planet, and we woke up uh, uh, on the surface of another planet hoping to find water. And we looked around us, and everything around us was lava rocks. Um, so exactly the wrong kind of rocks. You're hoping for, for sedimentary rocks that were laid down by water action. And instead, all the water that we thought was there had come along and like been 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 uh, covered over we with lava. So um, so so this was particularly disappointing, by the way, because we sent. Spirit to the place on Mars where we knew we were absolutely sure that she was going to succeed because from orbit you could tell obviously uh, it was a an, an ancient lake bed and we just thought it was a slam dunk for us and it was a real disappointment for us to get down on Mars and find that like no Mars had really faked us out so um so way 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 off in the hills way 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 off in the hills way too far for us to drive uh, there were these hills called the uh, the Columbia Hills. Um, and you know, we hoped that maybe if we drove our little hearts out, that maybe someday we would get close enough to those hills that possibly we would be able to see something that was sedimentary layers. Um, and uh, and we kind of set off driving for those hills, and um, uh, and it was a, a you know it was a, a long hard struggle. I don't want to 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 gloss over that, but um, uh, in 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 retrospect, it's practically the next thing you know that we're actually you know we didn't just make it to those make it close enough to those hills to see something. We didn't just make it to the base of those hills. We actually climbed all the way up to the very top of that hill, and uh, and took this took these beautiful images um, looking around us, uh, looking at the world around us. Um, so the images that we took from the top of that hill um, say a great deal to me, uh, not just about um, uh, about Spirit's struggle to get there, but about the team, about what it took for everybody to get her there. And, uh, and they remind me a, a, a great deal about the value of, uh, of persistence, of just absolutely, you know, the, the reason we made it is that we just set our sights on it and we never gave up. And, uh, and we, we made it all the way to the top of those hills. So, so that's, that's got to be my number one from Spirit. Um, from Opportunity, what's great about Opportunity is um, that on Opportunity, you keep getting these new missions. So we landed in Eagle Crater, and it was this, you know, this this brand new mission um, that, you know, we very first thing we like get off the lander and we go over and we discover, you know, evidence of water and rah rah opportunity really did her job. But then the next thing you know, we're exploring your heat shield, and that's like a whole. Uh, uh, rode all the way down to Mars uh, with us, and we actually got to examine pieces of a crashed spaceship on another planet. And then we, you know, went exploring around and in Endurance Crater, uh, uh, which was, you know, the size of a, a, a football stadium. And then uh, we're at uh, a, a Victoria Crater. Uh, which is a half mile across, and now we're at this like new crater, uh, Endeavor, which is uh, 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 13 miles across or something along those lines, bigger than Manhattan. Um, and uh, and the, so the great thing about Opportunity is um, uh, uh, she's like a slot machine that that keeps paying off over and over and over again. So you like pull on the slot machine and you get an Eagle Crater pop. 
pops out and you pull on the slot machine and Endeavor Crater, Endurance Crater pops out and you pull on the slot machine and Victoria Crater pops out and you pull on the slot machine and uh, Endeavor Crater pops out. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger and better uh, the more that she goes. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. It's It's been a fun ride, I'm sure, for... I mean, it's been a fun ride for us just watching from the sidelines, but you being a part of it must just be awesome. You know, the, the great part about it for me is um, we, I, I, you know, I'm, first of all, I mean, I'm, I'm one member of a team of, of, of 4,000 or more people who, who work together to make this mission happen, right? Uh, Steve Squires wrote a book about, uh, about this mission called Roving Mars, and you should totally read that book if you haven't read it. It's a great book. And he tried his best to thank everybody who was involved in that mission, the people who were overdrawn drivers like me and other operations people and people who were involved in designing the mission and, uh, you know, people in the payroll office and, uh, you know, without whom we wouldn't be doing our jobs, we wouldn't be able to afford to. And, and, um, and the little old ladies who sewed the airbags by hand in Ohio and everybody, try to thank everybody. It was more than 4,000 names and he figures he missed some people, right? Um, uh, and all of us worked and slaved for like three and a half years to try to make this project happen, and we, you know, skipped vacations, and we gave up dinners with our loved ones, and, you know, missed one thing after another, and we did all of this in the hope, the hope that maybe, if we were lucky, and, and we got really lucky, and everything broke right, and everything went our way, maybe we would get 90 days on the surface of Mars, right? That was our hope, and the great part about that is we didn't just get 90 days on the surface of Mars. Um, Spirit got more than six years on the surface of Mars, and Opportunity has got eight years and counting on the surface of Mars. So, so, uh, so talk about your slot machine that keeps paying off, right? <laughs> um, uh, it's it's been you know it's it's been it's been a great ride, and 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 part of the fun for me is uh, you know I know that this is like the best that my career is ever going to be. This is the coolest thing that's ever going to happen to me, and I'm loving every minute of it. And I thought I was just going to be loving 90 days of it, and so far I've been loving eight years of it, and I keep going, and that's just fine. I'm not complaining. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. Um, well, uh, we're going to move on from the Mars rovers now because we have another bigger Mars rover on its way to Mars right yes, now. We could you tell us about the Curiosity rover and how you uh, might be involved with that? Well, um, yeah, I would like to take this opportunity to announce for the very first time publicly anywhere that I'm uh, I'm one of the rover drivers for the team for MSL. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so I'm uh, I, I will get to keep my Twitter handle of Mars Rover Driver. Um, <laughs> I'll, I will continue to earn that uh, driving MSL around Gale Crater when she lands there. Um, if everything goes my Way. If everything goes as well as it could possibly go, uh, um, then uh, we'll be, you know, we'll be on uh, Mars time for MSL, uh, just as we were for the first 90 days or so of, of Spirit and Opportunity. And during the parts of Mars time that rotate around and kind of plausibly go through Earth time, I'm going to see if I can get to drive Opportunity once in a while. So if I get really lucky, I'll be able to drive MSL and Opportunity in the same week. That'd be awesome. Um, yeah. uh, but as you say, yeah, we uh, we launched successfully in. Um, uh, uh, November uh, uh, of, of this past year. Um, uh, Curiosity is on her way to Mars, already doing science uh, as she goes to Mars, taking radiation measurements along the way. Um, and we are looking forward to a successful landing in, uh, in Gale Crater uh, August of this year. Um, and uh, we'll be, uh, uh, it'll be a very exciting mission uh, driving that rover around on the surface of Mars. Um, among other things, um, uh, for one thing, um, uh, it's going to be, you know, with, with these rovers, it, I've gotten so used to dealing with, okay, the, the right front wheel doesn't work, but we can still turn, it's like still okay, it still does mostly what you want it to do. Uh, with Spirit, you know, you would drive around, you're sort of uh, the, the right front wheel, and Spirit had failed in a different way, so that we were basically dragging an anchor, it didn't drive anymore. And so we're kind of dragging that around, and like we kind of learned how to work around that. Opportunities are, like it doesn't move left and right anymore, but we've kind of like were, learned kind of how to work around that. And part of the, the really, the shock of the experience for me is going to be dealing with a rover that does everything it's supposed to. It's like actually, it's landing and it actually works. And like when you tell it to do a 360 degree turn in place, it actually does that thing that you told it to do. Um, when you tell the arm to like do stuff, the arm actually does everything you told it to do. So, so working with a, a rover that actually works is going to be an interesting experience. And um, the people who are working on making that rover happen have... Um, to some extent, tried to learn lessons from uh, Spirit and Opportunity 
um, and have tried to you know take uh, sequencing patterns that we do. So um, so for example, if you you know we have a sequencing pattern that we do to try to um, close in on a target for the arm to get just the right distance from it. And it's a whole bunch of commands and it's, you know, you, you sort of telling the rover like, you know, take a little step and update your position knowledge and if you're not close enough, like take another step of like the right size to try to get to just the right kind of uh, thing um, and on uh, on on curiosity that has been replaced by a single command um, so you can just tell it like okay all that complicated stuff that I normally tell you to do to kind of close in on an arm target and get to like where you're just the right spot that's just one command now and I'll try to tell you to do that and so they they take a whole bunch of kind of lessons that you know that that people have learned from driving spirit and opportunity around and have tried to make the experience of of driving the curiosity rover around. Uh, simpler in that way. So we'll see whether they actually succeeded at it, but they're smart people and they tried really hard, so I've, I've got my fingers crossed that it'll actually work the way it was supposed to work. Okay. Uh, can I'll, you kind of come... I'll, I'll, I'll oh. be letting you know how it goes. <laughs> okay. Sounds, sounds great. Can you yeah. kind of compare how driving this bigger rover is going to be different from, from Opportunity and Spirit? Um, yeah, well, uh, so so one of the differences is is what I was just talking about the uh, the fact that you know they've they've tried to learn some lessons from Spirit and Opportunity and tried to make things you know they've, they've worked to make things simpler um, and uh, and at least with some success I think um, so 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 a good effort and 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 I think they've actually done that job uh, reasonably well so that's one way in which it will be different um, another way in which it will be different is just that this rover is way bigger. Um, seeing this rover, uh, um, uh, kind of, kind of, I realized like how people who were used to the Sojourner rover in 1997 saw our rovers, right? They saw our rovers and went, "Wow, those things are big." Well, to me, Spirit and Opportunity are like normal, right? They were my first rovers, and so to me, they seem normal. And then I see this rover, Curiosity, and go, "Wow, that thing is big! Oh my God!" Um, so, uh, so, so the the wheels are about twice as big, and so you can go over obstacles that are about twice as big and so there'll be there'll be some some you know kind of getting recalibrated um, uh, also uh, the arm is um, uh, bigger and more complicated uh, than on spirit and opportunity so it's similar in some ways uh, but bigger and more complicated in other ways um, with spirit and opportunity when you took the robotic arm out you could take the robotic arm out and wave it around and do all kinds of stuff with it and the arm was so light compared to the rest of the vehicle that the rest of the vehicle wouldn't move detectably um, so things would kind of stay in the world where you thought they were. And that's not true for Curiosity. Curiosity's arm is so much bigger, and it's got this massive uh, turret at the end of it, that when you unsew it and you start moving it around, the entire vehicle actually flexes a little bit. Um, and so, uh, so we're still kind of working out our techniques for dealing with that um, as well. So there's going to be you know, ways in which it's simpler, ways in which it's more complicated, and we'll just kind of uh, learn this vehicle as a, as a brand new thing. Yeah. I've got to jump in. I've got, got a question. Yeah, just, just listen. Sure. Um, I was just wondering, have, you know, you're talking about, like, the lessons you've learned about sort of technique, but what about trying to minimize the wear and tear on the rover itself? I mean, you've gone through all of the breakdowns that have, that have happened with the rover over the last, you know, over the years. Do you think that there's a, you know, as a Mars rover driver, do you think there's any way that you would modify the way you drive Curiosity to try and sort of almost protect it over the long term? Well, this is a, that's that's a great question, and there's there's some interesting trade-offs there because one of the things that kills you is um, is using the rover, right? One of the things that kills you is you know obviously the more you turn the wheels, the more they the more chance you have that like something will break or something will break down or whatever. Um, but also on Mars, uh, the other thing that kills you is thermal cycles. Uh, Mars gets really cold at night, and it, it warms up significantly during the day. And it's um, it's uh, the the comparison I use is. Um, isn't really quite this bad, but you know, imagine like you took your laptop from Antarctica to Death Valley and back every day, right? Even if you never turned your laptop on, that 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 thermal cycling is going to eventually kill your laptop. You know, it's going to just like pieces of you know components will break and components will wear out, um, and so there's this um, there's this interesting trade that you have to make uh, where if you do nothing, the rover will break eventually, and and to some extent. Uh, the rover is, you know, it's kind of a use it or lose it situation. Um, we've we've taken that uh, um, uh, attitude with spirit and opportunity uh, every day. Back in the early mission, uh, when we really thought we had a 90-day lifetime, we used to talk about the sniper on the hill. The sniper on the hill was just going to take you out one day, and that was going to be it. You never knew when that was going to happen, and so you felt like you were constantly always in this race against time where you've got to absolutely do something 
uh, you, you know, you've got to take all your opportunities right now and, and do everything you possibly can right now because if you don't, you're going to lose the rover. And, um, and some of that will be true for curiosity as well that will just be like, we've got to get everything in, we've got to like, you know, just, just go ahead and like charge up that hill uh, in Gale Crater and, you know, try to do everything as soon as we can because you never know when a thermal cycle or something else that's just time-based is going to come along and kill you. So you want to do as much as possible as soon as possible. Um, so, so probably, um, you know, we'll, we'll land, we'll have kind of a checkout period where things are, 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 don't go too quickly and then we'll just accelerate like a bat out of hell and start driving for, uh, driving for the hill and kind of go down in our little valley and go up that hill and, and do everything we possibly can. Um, also, uh, with Curiosity, um, the real prize, you know, there's, there's other science along the way. I don't mean to minimize it. Um, but the real prize for us is, um, is actually sitting on the other side of that hill. So we get some clay minerals and so on when we get the other side of that hill. So there's a lot to be said for, um, you know, it's going to take us some, 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 some time, uh, uh, a couple of years to actually get kind of down and, and up over that. Um, but, uh, you know, the, the sooner you begin that process, uh, the sooner you successfully end it. Yeah. Uh, I know you're not involved in entry, descent, and landing, uh, probably, but um, well, I know a lot. Yeah, I know a lot of our readers are, are are really nervous about this new sky crane landing system. Yeah, uh, could you talk about your thoughts on on that? Um, sure. Uh, so the 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 sky crane. So with with Spirit and Opportunity, um, we had this landing system um, that. Uh, um, it starts off, you know, you, you kind of have a heat shield that protects you as you're screaming through the atmosphere. Um, and then you, uh, you kind of uh, pop out a parachute and a, uh, a, a little bridle that kind of brings you down. And you've got airbags, and the airbags can you kind of protect you as you bounce along the surface. And the airbags deflate, and you kind of come out. And we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that this was absolutely nuts, right? The fact that it worked twice... Um, and that something just like it worked for Mars Pathfinder, so it actually worked three times. We shouldn't forget that this was crazy. You look at the whole landing system, and this is hugely complicated, and, and, and you would be forgiven for placing a bet that said that's not going to work. Um, so, uh, so, so that was absolutely nuts. On MSL, we have a different way of landing it that is also absolutely nuts. Um, the way that it works is you have a, um, a sky crane, which is like a big hand with retro rockets on it, and the rover is kind of tucked up inside of the sky crane. And the sky crane, like, actually, it's a powered descent. It flies down through the atmosphere. And eventually, uh, the retro rockets fire, and it kind of, like, lets the rover go, and the rover's kind of land descending on a bridle. And it lands um, and brings the rover down, um, and then it cuts the, the bridle, and the, the, the sky crane part flies away. Um, uh, we would use the same landing system as, as Spirit and Opportunity, the same proven landing system, if it would work. But this rover is just way too big for that. It's way heavier. You're way more massive, and there's no way for the atmosphere to slow you down enough for, for you to bounce safely to a stop with a rover this heavy. So we came up with the sky crane uh, concept, and we're going to try this. Um, uh, I, I, I am not a hardware guy. I'm a software guy, okay? And I'm not good at evaluating, you know, kind of hardware proposals. So my way of looking at this kind of thing is to evaluate the engineers who are working on it. Are they sharp? Do they really have their act together? Do they really know what they're doing? And the guys who are working on EDL for, uh, for MSL really seem to be really smart, really sharp, really have their act together. And so um, I believe in the landing system for MSL because I believe in them, um, because they're, re they're really sharp guys. They really seem to know what they're doing. Um, my evaluation of them is that, that if anybody can make this work, they can do it. And so I actually have a lot of confidence in them and in, in that landing system. I don't think the landing system, uh, you know, it's always possible that Mars is going to fool me. It's always possible something is going to go wrong. I'm not saying I'm 100% right about this. Um, but if I were in Vegas and I were placing uh, my bets on it, uh, I would definitely be betting for this landing system to succeed. Okay, that's awesome. That's awesome. So, okay, um, Fraser, I think we'll check if we have some questions from people on chat. Sure. Do you want to yeah, hand that? Sure, I can handle that. Yeah, we've got a couple of questions. And so anyone who's watching this, if they want, uh, if you click on the, um, uh, on the post on Google+, you can actually ask a question, and, uh, and it'll add to the chat, and then we can, we can pose these questions. Uh, to Scott. So, so there's one that we got earlier on, though. Uh, Taylor Handleton wanted to know, uh, what sort of educational and professional background have you got on the rover team? Um, well, uh, I'll tell you about my, 
I, and then I'll tell you about some of the other people on the rover team. Um, I personally, um, I come from a background in computer science, so my undergraduate degrees are in computer science and English, um, and then my master's degree is in computer science, and I got recruited from my graduate institution to come work here at JPL. So that's my background is in, um, uh, is, is basically in computer science. Um, and I kind of conceptualize my job as like it's kind of a programming job. You, the rovers have a, a, a command language um, that's very similar to some uh, programming languages, and it's kind of like it's kind of like a smart dog. So a dog will understand like sit, stay, roll over, and the rovers understand you know drive forward by this much or turn this much or that kind of thing. Like they've got all, they've they've got commands that make it do that. And to me, it looks very much like a programming job. So um, so my background fits very naturally with that. Um, but part of what makes uh, the rover driver team really interesting is that people have all kinds of weird educational backgrounds. Um, so one of my other fellow rover drivers who might actually wander in here at some point um, uh, is named Frank Hartman, and his undergraduate degree is in sculpture, um, of all things. Like, you wouldn't imagine a sculpture person would be doing a job like this, but he is. Um, uh, we have people on the rover team with backgrounds in like chemical engineering and um, and and primatology and just all kinds of weird stuff. So so you would think that my English degree would be the weirdest thing going for an engineer, but nope, not even close. Um, and uh, and and part of what makes that I mean everybody has some some kind of degree in uh, in computer science or in uh, aeronautical engineering or something like that so everybody has some kind of relevant degree but the the educational backgrounds are actually really fascinating when you look around the team and I think that's part of what makes a team so interesting and so much fun to be on and and people come to it with like all kinds of backgrounds so you know our guy who's a sculpture guy. Um, uh, he did uh, the part of the software, the part of the rover driving software that involves 3D modeling. So actually built the 3D model um, that we drive around every day of of uh, of the the Mer rovers. And you can see how sculpture is actually a pretty good background, a pretty good fit for that kind of thing. Um, uh, uh, so so yeah so so uh, it can be just about anything as long as you also have a degree in um, some kind of degree in you know mechanical engineering or uh, aeronautical engineering or computer sciences in my case or something like that some kind of uh, engineering degree um, your other degrees can be quite fascinating quite uh, quite bizarre. So think like Wallowitz from Big Bang Theory, right? <laughs> um, what is what is his? I've I've watched that show, but he's I don't know what. Engineer. What, he, he's an engineer, and they make fun of him. Yeah, well, exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and was a, and and was a rover driver. So. Uh, absolutely, of course. Yeah. yeah, I saw. I I last I saw that episode where he where he uh, takes the girl in and and you know breaks yeah. the Mars rover. So yeah. Uh, so yeah. Oh, and here comes our sculptor now. As a matter of fact, I was just talking about you, Frank. Um. So another another one. I hope I'm pronouncing this right. So Detlef Crows asks, uh, Is anyone from the Mer team still trying to predict when Oppie will die, or do you guys consider <laughs> that to be useless? I mean, I, that's um, got to be a something that crosses your mind, which is trying to predict how long it's going to take for this this rover to last. How many days do you have left together? Look, uh, uh, every so far, everybody who's bet against the rovers has been wrong. It's a great way to lose your money, and if you want to bet against the rovers, I will take your money uh, because I will almost certainly win. I made the mistake recently of uh, betting against the rovers, not betting when when they were going to die, but betting against some other aspect of the rovers. Lost. Had to pay off of the steak dinner just last night, um, and uh, I, you know, I, I have this one rule: never bet against the rovers. And every time I break that rule, I end up regretting it. Um, so, uh, so, so I'll tell you what, dude. If if you want to bet against uh, opportunity, I will totally take your money. <laughs> if I've learned if I've learned one thing, it's that she's going to outlast any predictions about her uh, uh, about her lifetime. All right, so we've got another one here. So uh, Javier Hidalgo, and this is a very kind of inside one. I have a feeling that Javier also drives rovers for a living. But, uh, <laughs> but how has the localization subsystem on board Mer uh, affected your driving techniques? What did you learn? Um, Maybe you can explain what well, is the localization subsystem because I have no idea. Uh, I'm, I'm assuming that he's referring to the fact that uh, to, to what we call visual odometry. Um, so there's there's different kinds of localization that, that a person could mean. Um, one of them is um, uh, figuring out where the rover actually is in terms of the orbital imagery, right? In in uh, the case of like you know here on Earth, we don't really think about that anymore because who doesn't have a GPS built into their phone, right? You always know exactly where you are on the surface of the Earth. But when these rovers landed, 
we knew that they were within the, this this big landing ellipse, but that was kilometers. It could be anywhere within there. And so, um, so we actually had to, you know, kind of once we were down there on the surface, we actually had to like take measurements to things that we could see and kind of triangulate where the rover's position was. Um, and when we're driving the rovers around Mars um, uh, every day, you know, the rovers think they ended up in one spot, but due to slip and interaction with the terrain and everything, they actually could potentially have ended up in another spot. Um, so every day we actually have a localization uh, scientist whose job it is to, to figure out where opportunity actually is as opposed to where she says she is and kind of we relocalize her in the, the orbital imagery. Um, so that's a manual process um, that's done um, uh, mostly by a scientist named Tim Parker uh, with help from another guy called Matt Gollenbeck, both of them are members of the science team. And they do a great job of that, uh, uh, doing that uh, uh, relatively routinely. Um, so, so that's one sense in which we do localization. Another sense in which we do uh, localization is um, uh, Opportunity and Spirit um, have this feature called visual odometry. And the way that that works is um, when you're driving around, you're interacting with the soil, and you might think that you drove, let's say, a meter forward, but you're on a slope, and so you actually drove 90 centimeters forward, and you slipped 20 centimeters downhill. How do you figure that out? Um, well, the way that these rovers figure that out is with the technique called visual odometry. And the way that this works is you take pictures, and then you drive a little way, and you take more pictures, and you figure out, you figure out where 3D objects are within the scene. So, so you know, you find a, the, an interesting corner of a rock, let's say, and you find a whole bunch of collections of little points like that. And then you figure out from comparing those two sets of images um, how the objects seem to have moved in 3D space, and you can work backwards from that to figure out how you actually moved in 3D space. So you can actually tell, um, I think I moved a meter forward, but the only way to explain um, the way that these objects seem to have moved between these two images is by assuming that I actually went 90 centimeters forward and 20 centimeters uh, slipped downhill. So I'm going to update my own position knowledge to say that I did that. Um, uh, this is a feature that actually wasn't supposed to go into the flight software, and the guy who did it um, sort of did it as a little side project, and it turns out to be one of the most useful things that we can use for keeping the rover safe, and it is a, a, a big part of what's going into uh, Curiosity as well. And that has worked extremely well. That usually localizes the rover to, uh, our best estimate is it localizes uh, the rover to within a couple millimeters or so of where we actually are. So we get very precise knowledge about where we actually are uh, based on that. So uh, Evan Stratton wants to know, as a rover driver, what is your opinion of sending humans to explore the planets? I'm all for it. And if they would put me on a rocket today, I would go. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't even have to come back. And one would, way? You'd go with the one-way trip? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to be the first person on the surface of another planet, are you kidding me? Um, that'd be wonderful. So I would totally go. Um, if they don't send me, I'd like them to send somebody. Um, I am I am all for this, and and you know uh, I grew up wanting to be an astronaut, right? That was my my dream uh, when I was a little kid. Um, I would still love to be one, um, and I still I still believe in that. There's something you know, um, and I I, I want to say, um, sending humans to Mars is not something you do for the science, um, because um, even though a human can do more science per unit time, a robot can do more science per unit dollar. So if you just want to do science, if you just want to get the best return on your investment and do science, you send robots. But there's something magic about sending humans, right? There's something that, that, that robots can never do. As, as, as wonderful as these particular robots are, um, as excited as I am to be part of this project, there's something just genuinely magic about sending people to other planets. And I am all for it, and I would love to see it happen. That's great. Okay, do we have any other questions, Fraser? Uh, I think we're kind of reaching the end of our of our time. There was uh, one question wanting to know what the software and hardware. Oh, actually, they're starting to pile in now. Okay, hold on a second here. So, um, oh, okay, this is a good one actually. Cass Stevens wants to know any plans to incorporate AI in future rovers to make decisions about their missions on their own. <laughs> well, see, okay, here's the here's the thing. Um, artificial intelligence. They call it. They call things artificial intelligence only until they work. Um, and once they work, we don't call them artificial intelligence anymore. But hey, we've got a robot on another planet. That robot can drive around and like take images and figure out the geometry of the 3D world around it and figure out where there's scary stuff and not drive over the scary stuff but drive somewhere else instead, right? We would call that artificial intelligence if it didn't work. Um, and it's only because it does work that we don't call it artificial intelligence. Um, these, rovers, uh, that's, uh, these rovers have a feature um, called Aegis. 
And the Aegis software was, uh, uh, as with any of us, we get smarter as we get older. This was actually uploaded to the rovers uh, after they got on the surface of the planet. Um, the Aegis software can, like, the rover can drive to its location, um, take images of the world around it, um, find stuff in there that looks scientifically interesting, and beam you back pictures of just the scientifically interesting stuff. We would call that artificial intelligence if it didn't work, um, and it's only because it does work that we don't want to call it artificial intelligence. So we've actually got a fairly impressive collection of features on board the rovers uh, that that uh, that started off life as artificial intelligence research and have turned into actual you know working software on board the rovers, and that's true of uh, you know it's true of opportunity and it's true of curiosity as well. Yeah, I, c I can just imagine how terrifying it is to upgrade the software on the, uh, you know, whenever you're in something like the Aegis. Like I, like, I panic when I have to just upgrade my computer's <laughs> operating system. Like, I'm never going to see it again. But at least I can, like, go and crack it open and, and try and mess with the BIOS and try and fix it. But if you, like, remotely, you know, do you have that moment of panic every time where you just... Um. It, it is it is it is a little scary in that you know you 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 we talk about these rovers because we get pictures from them all the time and and we feel like we're inhabiting the rovers and we're right there and we know that at any moment something could go wrong with the rovers and they could be 100 million miles away again right and and software upgrades are one of those opportunities for things to go very wrong but they were smart about the way they did this um, every rover sorry the 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 rovers have two copies of the flight software on board. Um, uh, they have a sort of, you know, the, the current copy and an older copy. And, um, and what we do when we upload a new version of the flight software is we, upload, we, we overwrite only one of those copies. And um, if the rover tries to boot into the new version of the flight software and it doesn't work for whatever reason, it falls back to the older known good copy. Um, uh, so that's, that's one of the ways in which we make sure that this thing, which is, you know, it's, it could very easily be 100 million miles away at the snap of your fingers, um, that we still have, you know, the ability to kind of fall back to an older version of the flight software and debug it. And, of course, before we upload any new version of flight software, we, we test the heck out of it on the ground. We have a, a very high-fidelity copy of the rovers uh, sitting down in our test bed facility, and we make absolutely sure that it works on that rover before we even think about sending it to the real rovers. Cool. Um, I think I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take one last question. I think we can wrap it up. We don't want to okay. zip any more of your time. So other than the extreme temperature fluctuation, oh, sorry, Austin Go asked this one. Um, okay. Other than the extreme temperature fluctuations on Mars, what other environmental factors affect the rovers? Um, well, the, the, certainly the one that's on our minds all the time is that there's dust raining out of the atmosphere. Um, so uh, Mars has had nothing, Mars is, Mars is uh, I, I, I like to say that Mars is bored. Uh, Mars has had nothing to do for the last several billion years except uh, pick up small chunks of dust and bash them into each other and make even smaller chunks of dust, which are then even easier for it to pick up, and it bashes those chunks of dust into each other and makes even smaller chunks, chunks of dust and so on. And so there's constantly this dust like kind of floating and swirling around in the Martian atmosphere. The sky is the color it is because there's dust floating and swirling around in the atmosphere. Um, and that dust periodically just kind of rains out and settles on the solar solar panels is, uh, is bad news for a solar-powered rover. Um, so, so that's the worst one. And fortunately, we've had the, um, the experience that, uh, 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 in fact, we, we, we thought that that was what was going to cause our 90-day lifetime because we knew the rate at which the dust settles out of the atmosphere and lands on the solar panels of the rover. And we just thought that eventually that was going to kind of choke the life out of the rovers and that would be it. Uh, we did not expect for the wind to come along and blow the dust back off the solar panels, another little environmental factor, and, and that's what's, you know, the, the primary uh, factor in giving us a kind of periodic new lease of life. Um, we certainly hope that will be happening uh, for the rovers again, and, um, uh, and that that will uh, give opportunity to uh, get another new mission on the surface of Mars. Great. Okay. Hey, Scott, thank you so much for uh, being with us today, our, our first live interview. I, I don't oh, think we could guys. have picked anyone better. Aw, uh, thanks. <laughs> How nice so, our, all right. Well, thanks a lot, Scott, and uh, I'm sure we'll be keeping in touch with you as, uh, as uh, Curiosity gets closer and as, uh, as Oppie goes through her winter and then comes out in spring again. I'll be looking forward to it. It was great talking to you guys today. Thank you so oh, much oh, for having so, me. Oh, actually, one last thing. Yeah. How can people find more Scott? if they need more stuff <laughs> in their, uh, in their uh, diet. Well, they can always find out more about the rover mission at uh, marsrovers.jpl.nasa.gov. Um, so if you want to learn more about uh, Spirit and Opportunity, that's your source.
Um, I am Mars Rover Driver on Twitter and uh, under my own name, Scott Maxwell, on Google+. And um, uh, as I've said many times, I said this to you guys right before we went on the air, um, the hard part is not getting me to talk about the rovers. The hard part is getting me to shut up again afterwards. Um, so I'm always happy to talk uh, any kind of rover stuff with anybody uh, there anytime. Great. All right. All right. Thanks. All right, thanks a lot, Scott. Thank you, you so later. much. Bye. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks for joining us.